ناو دكتور عبد الله الحزيم سيد بروفيسور اوف ماتيريالز انجينيرنج ات جوبيل يونيفرستي كوليدج اند سعودي سوسايتي اوف تكنيشنز بورد اوف ذا اوف دايركتورز شيرمان ويل توك وذ اس اباوت اندر ووتر ويلدنج اند كوميرشال دايفنج بليز دكتور عبد الله يو كان ستارت ناو اند سوري فور ذا بروبلم اي بين نو بروبلم ثانك يو كان يو بليز ابلود ذا برزنتيشن يس يس يو ويل Well, um, thank you for the invitation, and I'm glad to be with uh, the Swiss University, and I'm glad to be among you guys. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the truth about underwater welding. There is a lot of rumors when it comes to commercial diving and uh, underwater welding. Some of the people said this is uh, the most dangerous job in the world. Some people, they said you can be rich doing this uh, underwater welding. Of commercial diving. So in this presentation, we're going to figure it out if it's this job is good for you, if you want to pursue and take this job, or you're going to be rich, or it's not for you. Can we go for the next slide, please? So, so for the, this uh, presentation, we're going to have the introduction, and we're going to see what is the media have to say about commercial diving and underwater welding. And then we're going to talk about the career. What is commercial diving, and how do you become uh, underwater welding? What is the route you have to take to be an underwater welder? And then we're going to talk about the process, the process itself, what is underwater welding, how it, uh, it happened, or what is the concept of Underwater welding, and then uh, we're going to talk about the methodology about uh, underwater welding, and then the last we're going to talk about the uh, the effective depth of underwater welding. Uh, next slide, please. So the world pipelines stated in their website that in the UK, just in the UK, the underwater industry currently uh, is about 80 billion pound, and um, it has the potential to to grow to 45 billion within uh, like uh, 10 15 years in the, in the 2035 and this will create more than 180,000 jobs with uh, more than 20 billion pounds in export just in the UK so we are talking here about big industry uh, and underwater industry so that's a lot of money so can we go for the next slide please the economics also stated the ups and downs on the North Sea for professional divers, and they stated that uh, uh, the professional divers or the commercial divers, uh, they get more jobs and they get more when the oil price going up, and they get less jobs and gain uh, pay less when the oil price goes down. So they stated, and I quote, when you when you go for diving, you sign up for a roller coaster life. Yes, you may make a lot of money, but uh, you don't uh, make a secure job for 12 months. Uh, also, they stated you can get an astronaut back from the moon quicker than a diver from the seabed. And how is that? How can you get an astronaut for more than 90 kilo if they are only in the space international space setup? 90 kilo in, uh, in the sky. And uh, commercial diving is only 400 meter on the bottom. Why you can get an astronaut faster than than a, uh, than a diver? We'll talk about that later in this presentation. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is a quick comparison comparison between the an astronaut, uh, astronaut and divers. So right now, I'm sure there is six astronauts in the space shuttle, international space shuttle. But definitely, there is more divers in the sea or in the water. Uh, total astronauts in the U.S. is 43. Right now, there is uh, more than 3,000 or uh, 3,600 divers in the U.S. And totally, there is only uh, 547 astronauts to date, and there is thousands and thousands of divers. This is a quick comparison between astronauts. So if you cannot go for astronauts, maybe you can go for diving. It's easier. Can we go for the next slide, please? So uh, do you think this commercial diving is dangerous? Well, if you if you go for if you click one more time, please. This is a statistic about the global fertility in commercial diving. Please uh, show the statistic. Click one more, please. See, so this is the global fertility for commercial diving. So this is from 2000 up to 2014. So 15 years window, and there is always fertility on these jobs. The lowest was dozen. Period, and then the highest almost 60. And this is not very accurate because some countries they don't report the fatalities according to the commercial divers. However, I'm not sure if this is much or or or, uh, or less because 
If you do a statistics about taxi drivers, you may have more fatalities than these people. So uh, it's up to you to, uh, to decide if these uh, numbers are way too much or not. Can we go for next slide, please? So the Forbes also stated 20 high paying jobs and the commercial driver is not the first one. It's uh, located at number seven. So there is a lot of jobs that uh, could pay more like elevator installer or repair, electrician, uh, and also transportation inspector, petroleum pump operator gets more money than the commercial driver, uh, electrical power line installer, and also subway operator. However, this numbers is based on per year. Commercial drivers usually make money in three or four or maybe six months, and they don't work the whole year. So maybe they get jobs for six months and then they are looking for job for other six. So they get uh, money in, uh, in a short time. So can we go for the next slide? <coughs> next one. Uh, this is a statistic so, uh, from the occupational employee uh, from the US. This is the baseline for commercial divers. Commercial divers work in a lot of sectors. Uh, so, in, uh, the highest paying for commercial driver is construction, so they make about uh, 68,000, and then water transportation about 63,000 per year, and then the uh, support services about 56,000, then uh, the government. So, it's, it's range about 68 to 44,000. Uh, this is the baseline salary or the startup salary for the commercial driver. Just to note that if you are Fresh graduate, for an engineering fresh graduate from school in the US, your starting salary will be from 60 to 65,000 per year. So these commercial divers, they only study four months and they get their diploma and then they get paid almost like an engineer or sometimes maybe more. So it, it could be considered for four months and then you spend four years and spend a lot of money paying your uh, tuition fee. Can we go for the next slide? So we already finished the introduction. We can go to this uh, second section, which is the uh, career of underwater. Next slide. Can you click one more? Click one more. Click. Mm -hmm. So what is commercial diving? Commercial diving is done below surface uh, that use uh, supply air and scuba equipment. Uh, commercial divers also use construction equipment, installing, uh, repairing, uh, use hand tools, power tools, also sledgehammers and also uh, use welding equipment. So basically it's a technician that work underwater. Technician take their skills and take them underwater. Can we go for the next slide? So in definition, if we can define commercial diver, any industrial operation done underwater. And then uh, commercial divers are divided into uh, different uh, sections. So we have onshore and offshore. The one on onshore is just like a regular employee. They wake up in the morning, they work for eight hours and they go back home. The one on the offshore, they go and stay there for months and let's say less weeks or, or a couple of months. And uh, in the offshore, they do saturating divers. Saturating divers, these divers are unique and these divers are special. They get the most money. They can make a lot of money because uh, they've been paid 24 hours a day. Even when they are sleeping, they are getting paid. So saturating divers, uh, these people are working underwater, and when you saturate, uh, they call it saturate, because when we breathe right now, we're breathing 21 uh, oxygen and 78% uh, nitrogen, 1% other gases. So uh, we breathe right now in one atmosphere, all of us, about six liter in your lungs, in one atmosphere. If you dive for 10 meters, then this is two atmosphere. The six liter in your lungs will be three liters. It will compress. So if you're still inhaling oxygen, I'm sorry, and still inhaling air, and you're breathing normally, in 10 meters, you're breathing double the amount of the six liter you have in your lungs. When you have a lot of air in your, in your lungs, it's not going to be in the lungs, it's going to be the six liter, but it's compressed now. So that's mean you have a lot of nitrogen in your bloodstream. This nitrogen will start to, start to dissolve on your bloodstream, and then it will stay in your bloodstream until you get rid of it. And it's not easy to get rid of it. We'll talk about this later in this presentation. Next slide, please. So commercial diving, there's a lot of jobs you can do. You can create a lot of jobs with commercial diver. You can do deep diving. You can dive in chemical and polluted hazard. 
So we will dive in sewage, we will dive in oil well. Things have to be repaired. So divers only can dive. You're not only diving in ocean and blue crystal clear water. You can dive sometimes in zero visibility. And most of the time, commercial divers will dive in zero visibility. You can dive also in nuclear plants. Nuclear plants also have uh, the cooling channels. You can be a diver for research, collecting samples and uh, taking pictures and videos. And also you can do uh, diving for coastals, or also diving for media if you want to do documentaries and stuff, or also diving for military. Next slide. Next slide, please. So equipment, we're not going to go deep into that, but this is my first dive. This is me jumping in the river. As you can see, I'm not wearing fins. I'm not like I'm wearing safety shoes, like I'm going to uh, my job fixing stuff in the lab. So wearing safety shoes, wearing coverall, and wearing my helmet. This is the hard helmet. The only thing that I need you to know that hard helmet has a lot of technology, a lot of things that can be helpful for the divers. However, the thing that I want to focus in that this helmet has speaker and a microphone. So you'll always be in contact with the people on the top side. Your life depends on your team. So your team is, is valuable for you. They ha you have to pick up your team because you will be uh, supported by them when you have any trouble uh, down there. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, this is a river in Florida. When you dive there, there's zero visibility because all the water is muddy. So zero visibility. You cannot see nothing. Uh, all you can hear is wishing sound like shh. It's scary, really. For, for the first time, you dive there, it's scary, and then you're going to get used to it. When you up there. Next slide, please. So the duties and responsibility for commercial divers, they do savage work, they do recovery, they do cleanup, and also they use cameras to take uh, inspect some uh, pictures or some records, also checking the docks and the ships, the buoy systems, the pipelines, the cables. Also, they take photographs, taking samples, evaluate the conditions and structure or, uh, or, uh, for, uh, for cargoes. Also, install uh, footers and pillars for bridges or, uh, or piers, and also removing sunken objects. So, if anything sunk and you want to, uh, to, to recover it, there you can uh, utilize commercial diving. They use cranes and winch. And also, they do calculation with airbags, so they will connect airbags and lift this uh, subject. They do have a lot of calculation they can perform. Also, they perform uh, welding and cutting and particing, and this is what we're going to talk about today. So the, the welding part, that is our subject today. Can we go for the next slide? Please, in, uh, one more click. So uh, judging, one more please, one more click. So judging from this photos, this platform, the broken platforms, uh, one more click please. So this is a broken platform that is uh, have to be repaired. So the first thing that you're thinking about is how we're going to repair uh, repair this uh, platforms. So one of the tools that we can repair this uh, platforms is using underwater welding. So underwater welding is suitable for this kind of solution and repairs and fabrication work. Next, please. So classification, there's a lot of ways of underwater welding. Uh, there is the wet welding, which is uh, the first thing that's come to your mind when a welder goes and be submerged in water and wet with them uh, with the wet suit and you will be uh, wet. And then there is the dry welding. So basically, regular welding that we do in topside, like whether we're going to do it underwater. So we can use uh, dry habitat, which is Habitat that will will it's a big habitat. You take it underwater and take all the uh, the water out of it and pump with it and uh, and helium and oxygen and the diver will go there, take his his claws and do the welding just like he's doing it on the top side. Or you can do a chamber. Chamber is basically like the habitat. However, it's going to be open from the bottom, so the diver can just jump back to the sea or dive to the chamber or uh, dry spot welding. This is a small box that can be covered by uh, or uh, placed on the pipe and then just pump some air on it. So we will take all the, the water out and then you can do the weld perform just putting in your hand or maybe head and shoulders on that box so you can just do the weld, perform the welds. So this is very small. And also you can do dry uh, uh, dry welding and what at one atmosphere. This is a habitat that can be uh, regulated to be one atmosphere. So you can do your your weld. 
and then also hyperbolic uh, hyperbolic welding, which is a big also chamber that is can be uh, pump uh, helium and uh, other gases that you can breathe and also can uh, work with it. And then the confirmed dam, confirmed dam is the reverse of the chamber, so it's going to be open from the top, just like the picture here. You see the last picture here. It's open from the top and closed from the bottom. This is usually when you're welding uh, sh in, in a shallow water. And then we have uh, the cavity welding. The cavity welding is in the, if you look at the picture, the, the far left. Uh, this is uh, a welding technique which is new and perform a good welding. We're going to talk about it later in this presentation. Can you go for the next slide, please? So we finished the second part. We're going to go to now for the know-how. So how this process work is next. Click one more. One more click. One more. Okay. So with welding, with welding basically when you weld and in a wet environment, um, uh, Basically, just like the one that ordinary you think about it, and this uh, kind of uh, welding is used for emergency repair and salvage work because it does not give you a, a good quality um, weld. It always show a poor quality weld because you know there is a lot of uh, um, uh, factors because of the wet welding and the wet environment uh, has cooling rate for the environment. We're gonna talk about it in the material section. Next, please. So as the, the, the regular welder, if you know about welding, the regular welding, every welding uh, or welder have to be certified for each process they use and also each material they use. So if you are a welder and certified to weld stainless steel, you cannot weld aluminum unless you have uh, PQR and the BPC and a lot of procedure and you, then you get certified of this process for this material. Also, the, the underwater welding, the, they have a code for that under the American Welding Society D3.6, which have to be uh, tested and certified through them, uh, through the code. So this certification, this is, for example, it's my certification. It does not have an expiry date. However, most companies, they will not accept certification without a proof of continuity welding. So if you stop welding for six months, then you have to recertify it. Most companies, not, not all of them, uh, or show that you have been welding for the last six months. Also companies, they just don't want you to be only a welder. They want you to be a welder by fitting, rigging, inspector, uh, and have a knowledge of NDT testing, and also photographer. They want you to be the ultimate commercial diver. And this skills, you can, I mean, most people can uh, get the grasp of it and can be, can be performed. Next, please. So how this uh, happened, I mean, you're thinking about electricity and water, and it can be get shocked, and how, how, how can we do that uh, underwater welding? Well, basically, uh, you will be uh, underwater and the regular machine, just like a regular welding machine, it's not, nothing special about it, so it's gonna be in the top. And there is the knife switch here, if you can see in the presentation, the knife switch. So uh, you put the ground in the, in the, in the place they're gonna, you're going to weld, and then the, the holding with the electrode, if you're using shielded metal arc welding, and try to, um, you have to have to use DC, DC current, because the electrons will, will jump through the, electro, uh, the electrode direct to the ground. And uh, this is the, the, the electricity bath. So if you put your hand between these path, you're gonna get electrocuted. So you have to wear uh, rubber gloves and make sure that the welding machine is open. However, this uh, knife switch is is on. It's uh, it's open, so it's the, the current the, the circuit is not completed. When you're ready, put your arc in place, and then you have to say top side, make it hot. Your, your team will say, Roger that, making it hot. So they, they will tell you that they hurt you and they are doing the, what you are asking them to do. So they will close the knife switch. Now you have electricity. So you're going to do your welding until you finish your rod. And then do not move your hand until you said top side, make it cold. So they will make it cold. So they will say, Roger that, we're making it cold. And then they will open the knife switch, and then you can go and change your uh, your rod if you're gonna do uh, another uh, another beat. Uh, so uh, we're going for next slide. So uh, this is how you're not getting electrocuted. 
if you're using AC current, then you're, you're dead. Okay, the, 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 basically we said the, the welding machine is the same welding machine that we are using. There's nothing special about it. However, in the, uh, in the electrode, there is special about it. So the, we're using the same electrode, 6013, 60, uh, 87, 70, 18, and 7024. Same electrode, every welder knows, and they use it. However, these electrodes, are uh, sometimes uh, covered with uh, uh, waterproof tape or uh, dipped in a sodium silicon so they will make you um, dry faster. And also, when you, you are a welder, you know that if you're gonna weld carbon steel, you only need from 60 to 120 amps. If you do an underwater welding, you will start, you're, you're starting from 30, 300 to 400 amps. There, there's a big gap between the welding on the top side and welding underwater. Underwater needs a lot of amps because you're losing heat through the quenching, uh, uh, fast cooling. Please click twice, come on. Mm -hmm. So the, how this uh, process happens, so when, when you have a hot, so the, the top side making it hot, so now you have electricity, all you have to do is put your, put your touch your uh, workpiece with your, with, your, uh, with your electrode and then move it little bit so you create in a gap the, the the electron want to jump from uh, the, the the electrode to the, to the material this jump it will create an arc the arc of spark or an arc this will have a high uh, because of the low voltage and high amps it will create uh, heat that will melt the base metal and also will melt your uh, electrode so uh, you're using DC, so uh, you will have uh, the workpiece will be your anode, and then the, uh, your electrode will be the cathode. Next, please. Next slide, please. So I'll show you this quick video here. Uh, it's about a minute. If you can even make it shorter, turn on the video, please. Uh, and I would like you to notice something weird going to happen in this video. And I would like if you can, anybody can tell me how this happened. Can you please turn on the, the, the video? Uh, maybe maybe it does not when you when you move it. I'm not sure. Yeah, it isn't working. Okay. Anyhow, I'll, I'll explain what's happened. Here is a, a commercial diver doing his performing his test, and when when he weld, he uh, he perform his weld, and then he take it to the instructor, and the instructor you know looked at it, and then they have photograph of this weld. Just right now, it started to rust. Rusting is, is instant when you do an in, uh, underwater welding because what is the three factor for rusting or for, uh, for rusting you have to have a cathode, an anode, and also electrolyte, and also see uh, uh, salt water also increasing this uh, this process. So uh, if, um, I'm not sure if I can play that for you. However, the the the, the welding bead started rusted right away. Okay, moving on, uh, risk involved, uh, you may, uh, uh, commercial diver may get electrocuted, and we already explained that. Hydrogen and oxygen uh, can be uh, dangerous because when you strike an arc, you basically break the molecules of water to oxygen and hydrogen, and you know hydrogen is very explosive, and oxygen will even make it worse. So um, make sure if you are doing welding, you're going to have a ventilation, so all the bubbles will go and go to the top side, go into the top. If you are welding in a closed confined uh, space, then the hydrogen will accumulate in the surface with, with, uh, with a spark. A small explosion can kill you because the water density is very dense and explosion will make it even worse. Uh, nitrogen, we said nitrogen, your blood, we're when we're talking about uh, uh, um, uh, saturated diver, we talked about nitrogen going into your blood. So nitrogen will be small bubbles in your bloodstream for the divers. So when we, they get up, these small bubbles will expand, right? When they expand, you need to give them time to let them go. And that's what they said in the Economist uh, magazine when they said you can bring an astronaut quicker than a diver because diver need times to release this nitrogen from bloodstream. They need at least weeks in the chamber to release this nitrogen from the bloodstream. If they did not release the nitrogen from the bloodstream, these bubbles will accumulate in their joint and they will, they call the sickness the bend. 
the pain it would be very very uh, harmful to their body and if in the worst uh, worst case scenario uh, this uh, bubbles will accumulate in the neck area right here and then it will block the bloodstream going to the mind or going to the brain and then divers may die also uh, ocean currents I don't have to explain that. Everybody knows what's ocean currents. A, a marine life, we don't want to be doing welding and chased by a shark, right? Next slide. So advantage of wet welding, it's low cost. It uh, does not cost you that much. And then speed, you can do it uh, very quickly and does not need all the equipment for hyperbaric chamber and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's easier. All you need is a diver jumping in with, an, with a regular welder, uh, welding machine to, to do it. And you have a free movement, so you can do multiple welds at the same time. Diver can swim to one weld and do that job, and then swim to another weld and do that job. Uh, next slide, please. Disadvantage, uh, hydrogen embrittlement. When we said when we break up the molecules of water, there is hydrogen. Hydrogen will go into your weld and make your heat affected zone hard, and then will have hydrogen cracking. And also, uh, we'll explain that more in details when we talk about metallurgy. And then um, it's 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 hard to see when you are welding there. The visibility usually would be zero, so it's hard to see where uh, where are you welding. And also, uh, you need to isolate all the cables so you don't get to the next slide, please. Dry welding, so it's called also dry welding or hyperbaric welding. Hyperbaric means hyper is high, baric is pressure, so high pressure welding. It's usually performed at elevated temperature, uh, elevated pressure. So it will most of the time, even though you're welding in a dry environment, you dry, you're welding in pressurized, uh, pressurized place. So, however, this uh, this welding, uh, uh, it will give you excellent welding, just like a welding that you are doing top side. It will be qualified for code, it will meet your code uh, standard and also can meet your X-ray uh, requirement. Okay, next slide, please. So this is uh, one of the uh, chambers. This they will uh, lower down to the to the pipe, and then uh, this uh, chamber is placed to the area. And then uh, you can use you, most welder. They will use gas tanks and arc welding for the roots uh, because it gives you a high quality weld. And then they will use gas metal arc welding um, because it's high deposition on on uh, on the in the pipe using this uh, hyperbaric chamber. Next slide, please. So hyperbaric chamber will be used, uh, they will contain uh, helium and also oxygen. Helium uh, to reduce the, the, the amount of nitrogen will be dissolved in your blood stream because you are working under pressure. You know the helium atom is smaller than the nitrogen atom, so it will escape through your veins and through your, your skin faster than uh, the nitrogen, so that will reduce your uh, decompression time. Uh, hyperbaric uh, is the limit right now is 400 meter. Most uh, all the jars is 400 meter. However, there is study to make it up to two kilometer, two and a half kilometer. However, they haven't. It's only the simulation and in the, in the uh, into the lab. They haven't done it uh, in a real life. And they also need to study the physiological uh, effect on the divers themselves and their bodies. Next slide, please. I think we're going back to the same slide. Okay, uh, advantage of, uh, of uh, dry or using hyperbaric chamber, you will be immune from animals, the marine life. There is no current inside because you're working just like uh, in your lab. No current, no marine life. There will be a very good visibility. They will be uh, laminated and you can easily use um, uh, NDT. You can easily join uh, do the joint preparation, do the alignment for the pipes, and do inspection. And they will be your, your make your life easier than just welding in the uh, in the wet environment. Next slide, please. So uh, the disadvantage is that this costs a lot of money. Costs a lot of equipment underwater, and also a lot of equipment above the water. Uh, there is a lot of. Uh, uh, equipment that have to be uh, complex to be installed. It's not easy to install. And if, if you are doing multiple welds, then you have to, to do one weld and, you know, ring this chamber, evacuate it from water, and then uh, and then do the weld and then take the, all that and place it to another place to do another weld. 
and uh, estimated to cost for each word of a single word about eighty thousand dollar for the single word. So uh, so it's very expensive, and it's also required a complex of equipment, top side and also underwater. Next slide, please. Cavity welding. Uh, cavity welding is another way of welding, uh, which is basically the welder will be submerged in water. There is no habitat or no, cha no chamber. However, he will be holding like a gun that is pressurized water. So it will push all the water and make a cavity. So uh, to cavity that is dry, and then you can weld it just like you're welding with, with the MIG. So, um, uh, introducing the gas and all the surrounding. So basically, yes, this is how we explain it. Uh, uh, so the cavity, the, ca the cavity, and then you just weld it with the make. So this is basically what is cavity on. Uh, next slide, please. This uh, operation produce a good weld, just like you see here, good, a good weld, almost like the one you want in the top side. However, that has a limitation, so it's a good in a flat surfaces, that's not on the pipe, so if you have curves, uh, the cavity will, will, will still leak some water, so uh, have to be in a, a, a straight surface that uh, you can do well on it. Next, please. So we finished this part, we're gonna go to the metallurgy part now. Next, one more, one more time. So hydrogen cracking, what is hydrogen first? Hydrogen is the smallest atom, moves very fast, it's highly abundant, it's the most abundant element in the world. Hydrogen, when it gets to your material, it will make it brittle. So when basically you strike an arc under water, you basically immediately sending the moisture and hydrogen into your material because you have multi material and you have in hydrogen and moisture. So this material will go into your microstructure. And then will will uh, will make uh, your your sample brittle and also will reduce porosity into your structure. Next slide, please. So this is the, the structure of um, ferrite, which is body center cubic. So the hurricane section of the crystal structure usually arranged into carbon rich region and also iron rich region. Usually the hydrogen tends to go to the carbon rich region, so they will cause hydrogen carbide, which make the material even harder and then will initiate the crack. If you click one more time, this is the uh, simulation of the carbon uh, atoms going into the, the structure. Carbon atoms is the smallest atoms, so they will make the structure even denser and also will make it brittle by forming hydrogen carbide. Next slide, please. So hydrogen cracking needs three things. Uh, needs a lot of hydrogen, which we already do because we are in water. And we have we need to have a brittle microstructure, which already do because we are welding and quenching at the same time. So you are welding and cooling, fast cooling at the same time, and also residual stress, which is we already having by creating the welding. So we have all three parts that is make it easy to have hydrogen cracking. Next slide, please. So unfamiliar structure transform and heat fitting zone can be avoided. How can we avoid that uh, hard structure? By controlling the cooling rate welding joint by using special isolation on the surface of the wood, uh, in the wood plate and also applying heat, high heat input. And also choosing the, the right material. So when you are welding in the deep sea, your yield strength has to be over 350 megapascal. Next, please. Finishing about the metallurgy, we're going to talk. This is a continue about the metallurgy uh, side, but in, in depth, so effect on the depth of the material. This is the last part. Hopefully, I did not take more of my time. So, what happened in the, when we go even deeper? So, increasing on the depth will have the tendency of dropping the alloy element. So, alloy element like magnesium and silicon will be lost. We'll, 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 we'll go back how this uh, material will get lost. Also, increasing uh, uh, increasing the depth will result in more um, uh, ferritic and less uh, SLR ferritic. So we'll have less. Uh, we'll, we'll lose some some carbon, and then we'll we'll lose some our microstructure like uh, martensite and bainite. And then the porosity will t uh, porosity in the world will increase in the depth when increasing uh, the amount of hydrogen. So every time we go deeper, we have more porosity. And then the uh, porosity will increase the hydrogen and oxygen uh, amount in your uh, uh, microstructure. 
and then the oxygen will react with the magnesium and the silicon, causing silicon oxide, and then they will, you're going to lose the magnesium and oxide in the microstructure. So basically, it's a circle. So when you go deeper, you can have more porosity. If you have more porosity, then you have more oxygen and hydrogen. When you have more hydrogen and oxygen, then you're going to have uh, silicon oxide and magnesium oxide, and then you're going to lose the magnesium and the silicon from your alloying elements. <clears throat> You're fine. You can you can go more. So you will lose uh, some microstructure and mechanical property. Next slide, please. So this is a weld uh, I've done in 100 meter depth. So as you can see, uh, the, the the first one is the weld. The second picture of uh, figure number B is the uh, uh, X-ray of the, the bead, and you can see all the small dots here as gas uh, pockets. So it's full of porosity uh, of this. Um, uh, of this world. So there's a lot of porosity, there is a lot of gas inclusion and water inclusion. So water basically, if you have gas inclusion, the hydrogen and the oxygen molecule, later on it will combine and create water inside your your world lens. Next. So this is a graph uh, showing that the deeper you go, so the more water pressure you have, the more uh, porosity you're going to have. And we just explained that in the previous slide. So next. So yeah, the hydrogen diffusion, basically I'm going to explain the figure here which is stated or summarize everything. So if we have a fast cooling or speed cooling or quenching effect, then we're going to have a hard, uh, very hard heat affected zone. And then the very hard heat affected zone will result into a cracking or uh, cracking hydrogen or hot cracking or even cold cracking. If we have more hydrogen content increase, then we are going to have again the cracking in the heat affected zone or this hydrogen will result into gas pockets or porosity. Uh, if, if you go deeper, the, the arc will, uh, will not be stabilized, uh, not be st stable. So uh, if you don't have a stable arc, then you're also going to have porosity. Also, uh, you will have uh, carbon content. If your carbon content increase, then you're going to have carbon monoxide in the, in the microstructure and also carbon dioxide in the microstructure. Also, if you have oxygen content increase, then you're going to have, will, will react with the carbon and form carbon dioxide also, or carbon monoxide, and also can react with the magnesium and the silicon we just talked about. And then we're going to have also inclusion. And all that will affect the mechanical properties for your weldment. Next, please. So to reduce hardness, this is some techniques that I found a study about it, that they use a timber bead. You basically, they are using the sequence if you're using sequence, then you're uh, you're making more brittle material. So you're making bainite and uh, uh, bainite microstructure and martensite. So your material will be uh, hard. So uh, instead, you can use uh, timber bead, which is you do like one and then a gap and two, and then you go back and do three, four, five. Uh, this will uh, this will uh, result in a fine. Uh, this will result in a fine ferrite and perlite uh, microstructure. So it will reduce the bainite and micro martensitic uh, microstructure in, the, in your uh, microstructure. Please, next, almost done here. Also, depth uh, and toughness. Uh, this is another study uh, shows that if you're using, uh, if you are doing underwater welding, up to six meter, it's fine to use 100% argon. Uh, after the 60 meter, then you're gonna have a high drop in your toughness. Then you have to use mixed gas, which is argon plus uh, carbon dioxide. That will, will stabilize your toughness and your sample. Next, please. So porosity also, uh, the porosity position, uh, as we said, you're using 60-13, which is have little hydrogen. 70-18 have hydrogen on it. 70-24, this is an electrode uh, that you use in shielded metal arc coating. So these two electrons has some hydrogen on it, plus that the hydrogen they would create and get from the envi wet environment. So hydrogen content in the water is between, the, in measure between 50 to 80 milliliter per every 100 gram of, uh, of material. However, uh, if you compare it with the, the, the hydrogen content on the, on the surface is about like 35 milliliter, which is way less than the one on the underwater, which is obvious. Next, please. So in conclusion, we're going to try to conclude here or summarize what we talked about. The major issue is in, uh, the contact with water. Contact with water will lead to hydrogen cracking, will lead to 
arc instability with depth will lead to porosity, will lead to loss of elements, alloying elements, and also will lead to hydrogen cracking and hardness in the heat affected zone. Next, please. So future work, uh, there is a lot of work to be done in uh, shielded metal or uh, or manual welding because it's still showing a poor weld. However, it's all it's only good for you know quick repairs. It's not good for making uh, high pressure pipes or stuff like that. Uh, hydrogen cracking is still an issue. Um, I think they need to, to invest more on robots and ROVs. Uh, ROVs is remote automated vehicles like small submarine that can do the jobs. And also uh, using different techniques like uh, friction welding and laser welding, and also uh, invent new technique. That's it, I'm, I'm done. I hope I did not take more time. And if you have, please have any question, um, I'm ready to hear that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. for this great information. Uh, if anyone, if anyone uh, had a, had a question, please uh, raise his hand, and we will open his uh, his mic. Please, Ahmed, go ahead. If someone is raising his hand, but I'm not sure how they turn his mic on. You can open your mic and uh, tell Dr. Abdullah uh, your. Hi, I have a question about replacing engineers uh, who do underwater welding. In the future, replacing them with the robots. Uh, uh, in that in that time, what uh, is their future? How it will be? Well, uh, ROVs are now are being used. However, it's used for inspection. So they will put cameras and then they will you know drive it on down and you can. So, so they taking some part of the underwater welder. However, flexibility of the underwater welder. It's it's cannot be uh, it's cannot be replaced by by a robot now because underwater welder can clamp onto structure can go down into the pipes can go into the confined spaces it's I think we still need 100 years to to make a robot that can do um, what under commercial diving can do however the robots can do some of what the commercial diving just like I said the commercial the, the uh, inspector. They can before they send the commercial. Okay, that's mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that, and I hope you guys enjoyed it.